Okay, so this is the, the talk I'm going to give today, Geoscience and some Mineral Physics. The outline of the talk will be the following. We will start in with some introduction to the Earth system. Then comes to some mineralogy of the different layers of the Earth interior, and then trying to explain how can we get pressure, density, elastic moduli, evolution against depth. And uh, hopefully I can manage to, to show you some, uh, some example, how can we work out by bridging seismic data together with mineral physics to get some insight on the Earth inner core. So the Earth structure, perhaps most of you, you know already, here I give you some brief introduction, uh, especially about the state of the matter. So we have the outermost part, we call the crust. Then you get to the density, uh, very massive part of the mantle, where you have uh, solid states, but still we have thermal convection, so the mantle moves a little bit. The movement is about 10 centimeters per year. If you go down after the mantle, you get to the liquid outer core, it's liquid, so it's a melted iron nickel alloys, and you have a rapid steering fluid here, just about 10 kilometers per year. Uh, sorry, uh, it was that one. If you go down again up to the center of the, of the Earth, you get to the solid sphere, the Earth inner core, which is about 1,200 kilometers uh, uh, radius, and it is a very special place where you can have uh, high pressure and high temperature condition, 6,000 6, Kelvin, 360 GPA. And uh, this sphere grows very slowly since the discovery we, in 1936 has been grown by about eight centimeters, okay? So this is a, just an overview of the different state or the different slabs constituting the Earth interior. And as uh, you can imagine, spacecraft have been reached many hundreds of millions of kilometers far away from the Earth's surface, but if you go in, in the other direction, if you try to drill a hole on the, on the Earth, you can reach only 12 kilometers. So here, as an example on this slide, you have the, the crust here, and you start the mantle. If you take nat natural caves, for instance, in France, 1.5 kilometer depth. Mines in South Africa, 3.8. Drilling seabed, 1.7. Wells, USA and Russia, maximum 12.2. So we're still far away to reach the 6,370 kilometers down to the Earth inner core. So we don't have samples to compare. And which is worse, we don't expect to get any. <coughs> so how can we work out and to, to study the geoscience of the Earth inner core? So we need to mix together different disciplines First, we use seismology, okay? So seismology is a rem very important remote sensing technique. You have basic uh, a source and a receiver. You're just monitoring the, the waves that are traveling inside the Earth inner core, and you get some information, especially about velocity discontinuities, and then you try to relate this velocity discontinuity with theoretical methods and high pressure and temperature experiments. So if you start from uh, the information you can get from seismology, you can get, as I said, velocity distribution in the outer, oops, in the outer part of, the, of our planet, the crust. You have basically a graphitic layer and basaltic layer, much more thick on the continental side and very thin in the ocean side. So if you uh, comes to the mineralogy composition of the outer part of the Earth inner core, we speaking about surface rocks. You have three different ways to get them. Sedimentary rocks, when sediments are deposited on seafloors. In this case, you have basically limestone and sandstone materials. You can have, of course, igneous rock, where you have melted magma. And this, you have granite, bosot, and pyrodite. Those uh, minerals have this following composition. So all of them are basically silicon, silicon dioxide, the major uh, percentage. And the rest is, uh, it comes from aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, and sodium oxide. The third mechanism uh, that can create rocks is a metamorphic rocks and comes from a metamorphic transformation when you have high pressure and temperature acting on the previous two rocks. 
So what comes after the crust? Then you have lithosphere and stenosphere. Well, I'll try to be fast here. Basically, there are two layers, uh, rigid, cold layers here above. The uh, one layer that is more viscous and, and uh, warmer, so it can, uh, can move. So, so to say, the lithosphere can float over it, and they will explain the plate tectonics motion. What do you get from seismology? You get velocity distribution here as a function of depth. So as I, I said, lithosphere, you have a certain velocity, then it goes down because you have a warmer material, seismic waves are propagated slower, and then comes the upper mantle. Upper mantle is starting from, let's say, 200 kilometers up to 700 kilometers depth. You have, uh, see, the stenosphere low velocity zone, and then comes the velocity discontinuity because of the main composition of mantle, you know, is olivine. It can take transition to spinel and perovskite. <coughs> so the, uh, the guy here, olivine, is the responsible for mantle uh, transition. Olivine is a is an end member, is, is something that is lying on the uh, two end members, phosphorite, where you have all magnesium, or phyalite, where you have all hydrogen. So olivine is basically 90% magnesium and 10% iron. So even though iron is a small uh, quantity inside the olivine, it can take um, important effects such as high spin, low spin changes during pressure increase. Other major components of, uh, of mantle, upper mantle, are orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, and whatever I'm saying here, I'm speaking about uh, phase, transi phase transition. Uh, suppose you know now that uh, simply no change in chemical composition, but uh, simply a reorganization of atomic position. We go still down from 700 to 2,900 kilometers. We get to the lower mantle. Velocity distribution are very homogeneous here. There are no uh, discontinuity like in the upper mantle. Still, they increase with uh, depth because we increase in pressure, the material gets more dense, and then increase the velocity propagation. So in the, in the lower mantle, since we are in homogeneous condition, changes in velocity are given to uh, different uh, thermal composition. Uh, for instance, certain places can be colder than others, and so can be faster than others, speaking on the wave propagation velocity. Uh, composition of the lower mantle, basically uh, perovskite and magnesium skite. And um, yeah, simply this characteristic is very homogeneous in the wave uh, propagation. Finally, we get to the earth inner core. First evidence of the earth inner core comes from uh, Oldham in 1906. So he, he was studying the travel times of seismic wave, and he found that they arrive um, lower than, uh, sorry, okay, uh, they, are they are, were arriving uh, with more time than expected from, uh, from homogeneous mantle. So he supposed the existence of a material below the mantle where the waves propagate slower. Six years later, Gutenberg managed against, again, uh, by managing uh, seismic data to fix the discontinuity between the lower mantle and the, and the core, 200. 2,900 kilometers. Then 1926, Jeffrey found that shear waves did not pass through the outer core, so he found the leaking nature of the outer core. And in the end, 1936, a Danish seismologist, Inge Legman, found the existence of a solid inner core at the very center of the Earth. So what's the composition of the Earth inner core? It's basically iron-nickel alloys, 5% of nickel, about 10% of light elements of iron louvers or siderophiles elements. And you can see here, if you take the pure iron, high pressure temperature experiments against the uh, density, you can clearly see it, but you need 2% uh, of light elements to match the density from seismic models to get the pure, pure iron. So we need to reduce the density of pure iron by 2% of those light elements. It's even uh, clear in the, in the outer core, we need uh, up to 10% of light elements to match the density of pure iron together with seismic models. And why iron or nickel in the center of the Earth? Well, the first was uh, Albert Birch in 1940, 
who proposed that the Earth it was a very similar system, like uh, meteorites that are falling on the Earth's surface. So basically, chondrites, they have uh, iron nickel alloy composition, so you just extrapolate it. And he supposed that the Earth inner core was also uh, iron nickel based alloy. Then you have to also take into account that if you started from the nebular hypothesis, uh, starting the, the origin of the universe, stars start to light up, burning hydrogen, and you have starting the fission and fusion processes. Whatever you can see here from the bandy energy of nuclei, if you start from the left side, from a, a, a smaller elements, so if you stay from, uh, from fusion, from uh, smaller elements, you can uh, have a spontaneous uh, reaction to get to stabilize iron groups, iron nickel groups, and the same you have it from the right hand side. If you start from fission, from heavy elements, you get to spontaneous uh, uh, reaction to get a stabilization of iron nickel group. So in stellar processes, the, the abundance of heavier elements always end up to iron nickel groups. So that's why during the uh, process of formation of the proto-earth, where you have segregation of uh, elements, the heavy elements, in this case, the most abundant iron nickel, went slowly down by attracted by gravitational forces and taking with themselves some iron louvers elements. So they went to form the composition of the Earth inner core. So I'll be, we'll be speaking to the results of seismic models. Let's see how can we produce them. Basically, you can have a, a database of different epicentral distances, source receiver distances as, as a function of travel times. When you get them, you get two choices. You get just uh, Use the inverse model, so you just invert the travel times and get a velocity distribution. Or you can use the forward model, which means that you suppose the existence of velocity depth model. You calculate travel times, you compare with the server ones. If they're okay, you keep it. If you are not, you continue to change it until you get an agreement. So the result is what we have been showing before. Here you have one reference model, for instance, uh, for PREM, it's a well-known uh, reference problem. Surface up to the center of the Earth, velocity, two kinds of velocity, alpha, or if you want to call it VP, compressional velocity, and beta, Vs, shear velocity. So you can see this continuity here, I'm giving the lower mantle, outer core, inner core. Of course, there is not velocity of S waves on the outer core because it needs shear waves needs shear stresses that are not existing on liquid material. <clears throat> so very fast here, you can have a different seismic database, so you can have different models. The characteristic is that all of them are spherically symmetric. So you can use one of them to study anisotropy of the Earth. So any, any deviation from those models will indicate indicates, uh, anisotropy on the Earth. Evolution of P and S wave as simple polynomial function as a function of depth. And what's perhaps most important for material scientists is that once you have alpha and beta evolution with depth, using some very well known elasticity relations, you can get also the Poisson ratio simply as a function of alpha and beta. So if you have alpha and beta evolution against depth, you can have a Poisson ratio you can have shear modulus, bulk modulus, and lamin constant. What is left here is density. So it would be nice to have also density evolution of the Earth, starting from the surface up to the center of the core. To do this, we assume that the material is homogeneous. So we have different layers, basically crust, mantle, outer core, inner core. Every, every layer is homogeneous. We are in a hydrostatic equilibrium and adiabatic condition. So we take a sphere here, and we assume that the, the variation of pressure at center point is given by uh, the thickness of the shell above it and the weight of the shell. So if you have any shells with a certain density and certain weight, every, every uh, weight of each shell has to sum up up to giving a certain point the pressure variation. So if you just uh, rewrite this equation in a differential form, and you introduce the gravitational acceleration with, with a well-known uh, formula, depending on the gravitational constant, the mass inside a sphere radius r, put in here, have a little bit of working uh, maths. I'm going fast here, otherwise I won't finish my talk. I get in 
the, the density distribution against depth, with the, which depends on constant mass inside a sphere radius r, density evolution, and alpha and beta. So how to get the mass inside the radius r? What we need to do is just to know the total mass of the Earth that you can simply have access by studying period rotation of satellites and removing the mass of the out outermost shell. So once you do this, you realize that this is a self-compression model because you, once you have a certain point, the density is given by uh, the mass you have on top of it. And if you see, uh, this model does satisfy seismic data, of course, because it comes from them, but does not satisfy the moment of inertia. So if you calculate the moment of inertia uh, of the Earth, which depends on the radius, the mass, and a constant, which gives you an idea how the mass is distributed inside the Earth, you can see that the observed uh, I is much greater than the one that comes from self-compression of density. So why this? One can try to uh, look at the assumption we made. The first one that was a temperature gradient, was a perfectly adiabatic. But as I told you, you have a steering raw material inside uh, the outer core and the mantle. So you might assume that the thermal gradients are super adiabatic. To, to account for this behavior, you can add here uh, an extra term, coefficient of thermal expansion, multiplying density, and the tau, which is a constant, which is positive, can allow you to reproduce super adiabatic condition. What is important here, you have a positive sign and negative sign. So if you do this correction, actually, you have density increase more slowly than before. So we go in the opposite direction. We need to find another explanation of the missing mass on the mantle. The explanation here is uh, looking at the other assumption we made. If you remember in the beginning, I said we have homogeneous material with just phase transition at the core and the lower mantle and the outer core and inner core. So if you account now for the phase transition on the lower mantle, the olivine that takes uh, the form of spine and the perovskite, then you can uh, find out the 10% of mass missing in the mantle. And uh, in this case, you can have the solution of why this model was uh, failing on the, on the muscle of the month, just because we forgot to introduce this phase transition. So in the end, starting for seismology, taking the equation for elasticity, we have the overview of the uh, density evolution from, again, from the surface to the center of the Earth. You have the bulk modus revolution, the shear modus revolution, and pressure. Pressure that gets uh, very high up to 360 GPA. So the way we calculate pressure, uh, which is very important for scient uh, material scientists, is uh, with the same uh, mechanism we have been showing you uh, for the Adam Williamson equation. So the variation of pressure is given by the column of certain height and density that gives you a force over a, sur a surface at a certain point. So if you want to uh, reproduce the, the pressure evolution inside the Earth, from the surface to the center, you just have to resolve the integral where you have the gravitational and the density evolution coming from Adams Williams equation. Suppose you know that if you use international units, definition of pressure force acting on a surface, the pressure of the earth inner core is estimated to be 360 GPA if you want around something around 3.6 million atmospheres or 3.6 megabar. So let's see if I can manage to, to, to finish the study case, the Earth inner core. So again, you start from uh, some evidence. So the seismic data tells you very interesting things about the Earth inner core. If you have an earthquake here and you have uh, uh, waves traveling to this direction, almost parallel to the Earth spinning, uh, spinning axis, you can register travel times, and then you compare with another earthquake occurring here and register it in the equatorial direction. Okay, so if you, travel, you compare travel times, this direction is about 3% faster than the equatorial plane. So we, we would like to try to explain this evidence. 
So seismic data gives you an evidence. You want to try to explain why this cam is happening. One uh, explanation can be lattice preferred orientation. So the outer core is liquid and slowly try uh, to crystallize to increase the size of the earth inner core. Uh, newly crystallized iron at the, uh, the shallower part of the earth inner core can be oriented in different direction. And so they might explain this seismic anisotropy. To do this, we, we need a lot uh, of seismic data. This is a video, and I could put this. Okay, so the red dots are, uh, yeah, the, the red dots are the, are the epicenter of the, of, the, of the earthquakes, and the greens are the, the stations. So you can see you can monitor with your wa uh, waves uh, originated by earthquakes in different directions, and you register the travel times uh, according to different proving direction, okay? <coughs> that makes you see the, the earth inner core here. And once you have all this database, you can have access to uh, different kind of information, depends on the wave you're registering. Well, maybe it's enough. If you're interested, for instance, at the first shallower part of the earth inner core, the first 100 kilometers, you might be interested in uh, taking the travel times of PK, IKP uh, waves. So the yellow and green lines, you see. Here there's a wave that is uh, reflected and a wave that is passing through the Earth inner core. So since the path here is very before and after is very close to each other, you can just take the reference of travel times, so you get a direct proving of the Earth inner core. So the uh, seismograms, the first arrival is the transmitted one, and the second arrival is the reflected one. <coughs> if we, you're interested to a depth, uh, more deeper uh, proving, we need to get to another wave, kind of waves, and the PKPDFOBC. So basically the same wave here, a tr transmitted one, and that one that passing exactly on the outer core, you can reach about 350 or 400 kilometers with this methodology, but of course you have to assume that the path of these waves are very similar to the one below. So there are more errors here in the, when you take a difference of travel times. What you can see uh, from those waves, okay? So if you take the observed travel times and you make reference to a, a symmetric model, for instance, PREM, and you plot together as a function of epicentral distance. If uh, those waves are proving uh, an earth inner core with no anisotropy, those points will stand on a zero line, okay? If, on the other case, they will stand above, they're positive residuals, there will be faster wave propagation than a reference model, and vice versa, if they are uh, below the zero line, they will be uh, slower. So you can see here the red uh, points are Western Earth inner core hemisphere proving, and all of them are predicted to be slower by 0.3% with respect to the uh, reference model, whereas the Eastern hemisphere is 0.5% faster. Okay, so this we call hemispherical dichotomy. We have one hemisphere which is faster and the one which is slower. <coughs> The same results can be plotted here. And this is a, a surface of the Earth inner core. You see on the western side, you have basically yellow and gray points, so slower velocity propagation. And on the eastern side, you have uh, basically green and blue, so faster velocity propagation. Why this can happen? So it might be a reason uh, related to the thermal convection. So, so let's suppose you have a uh, Again, this is the CMB, core mantle boundary, ECB, inner core boundary. Suppose you have a here a less uh, temperature than on the eastern side, okay? So the, the liquid here can try to steer in one direction, and as been shown by experimental uh, techniques, you can stabilize here a sort of cyclonic front, whereas the inner core experiments are colder side, 
okay? So if you have a colder side here due to the uh, heterogeneous um, thermal convection in the CMB, then you might say that in this part, the crystallization of iron from the outer liquid uh, part will be faster, okay, because you have a colder place, you have greater porosity, small grains, and then small grains, more barrier to cross for waves, less velocity propagation. So this is one of the reasons uh, you can explain why one hemisphere is, is lower than the one is faster. There have been also uh, geodynamic simulations where, again, the western hemisphere has been shown to be the crystallizing side. So you iron crystal from the outer core crystallized in very small grains. And in the eastern hemisphere, you have a melting side, so larger grains. So the, this, this kind of mechanism, we create a sort of topography, positive here, that we crystallize faster, and negative here. There would be a situation which is not stable. So we want to keep the center of mass, so there will be a drift of material from the western hemisphere to the eastern hemisphere to compensate the topography. So, and why, we can speculate a little bit, why does this kind of heterogeneous thermal distribution the earth inner core? Okay, someone claimed that uh, this is due to the uh, Jaya impact, okay, when uh, the proto-Earth uh, uh, got a collision with the Theia, an asteroid of size of almost roughly around Mars. They just smashed together, uh, just melted, and uh, some places you get some uh, corona debris or silicates, and suddenly uh, our moon pops up of the, of the Earth. So this might have left some imprint and some heterogeneous thermal convection in the Earth inner core. So we want to use uh, mineral physics to try to explain why the iron crystal might be oriented central direction in the Earth inner core. And uh, first, we, we, I will review what, uh, three different types of mechanisms why the iron crystal could be aligned in different directions. The first one is due to the rapid steering liquid iron in the outer core here. So if you have a uh, spherical symmetry, a rapid steering material, geodynamic simulation shows that you can form tyler columns where the heat is preferentially goes in the equatorial direction. So if you, uh, you have this part is colder than the poles, here that we crystallize faster than, than here. But again, this situation, we create something which is not stable. So strains will, will occur to redistribute material, and these strains, they might align crystals. If you also consider that the lower outer core would be a supersaturated iron nickel melted uh, composition, then you might, uh, might accept that there would be some dendritic crystallization. So the multi-branching tree likes uh, crystallization, sort of fractals. And also, you can have a massive, Maxwell stresses if you consider that the Earth's inner core passing through the, the solid inner core will act in on a magnetic or uh, sensible uh, material, like iron. So, let's see how a mineral physics comes in on, on this investigation. Uh, I'll just briefly review the two different phases, hexagonal and uh, body center cubic iron to be two likely phases for the earth inner core. There have been uh, both experimental high pressure temperature experiments to confirm this and theoretical calculation. Although the iron BCC has been a little bit uh, critical because in the beginning uh, people found out it was mechanically unstable and then the in the end, we found, they found that it actually was a dynamically stable system, so it was restored back as a possible phase for the Earth inner core. So to do this, we need uh, theoretical tools. Uh, it's a quantum mechanics tools. I'm just going roughly here, you to need to solve the Schrodinger equation with different approximation. What we do is a density functional theory. We just uh, reduce the dependency of the wave function for three times n particles coordinates to three, three spatial coordinate density. That allows you to solve the Schrodinger equation a single particle approximation. And there you can get the thermal, thermodynamic stability of different system, uh, elastic constant, sound velocity, etc. as I show you in the next slides. 
So this is the reason why in the beginning the Iron BCC was removed from the possible phases for the earth inner core because if you do the main path and you change it already started from 300 GPA and if you do a, a tetragonal transform, uh, distortion you see the BCC is, is unstable against the tetragonal distortion. So it's mechanically unstable and the reason for this is due to the existence of soft modes, so negative modes around the X point. Uh, but this is again uh, our calculation at zero Kelvin and high pressure. If you, what happens if you plug high temperature uh, conditions? So these uh, negative soft modes are disappearing, and this is um, restore back the iron BCC uh, together with hexagonal phase for the earth inner core. So here I resume the cartoon. You have a pressure range and temperature. The yellow area is the area of stability for iron BCC. And this overlaps perfectly with the condition of the Earth inner core. The theoretical tool gives you also the possibility to, to play a game and see what kind of composition uh, can match the uh, pressure density evolution from seismic model. Here, for example, are uh, just calculation at zero Kelvin high pressure. And I can, you can see that this line, which is iron, nickel, and silicon, takes perfectly the, uh, the density of PREM. But of course, this is not. Uh, believable because, because we need to uh, address for the high temperature condition. So another very important point is that you can uh, manage to calculate the stiffening tensor of the, the model phases. Basically just monitoring the variation of internal energy against the applied strains and uh, knowing the density from the Adam Williamson equation, you solve the Christopher equation and you get to the velocity, sound velocity propagation. So for the two materials, uh, the model phases, hexagonal and cubic, we can calculate with molecular dynamics, the stiffen tensor, plug it here, and using the density from Ada Williamson, and get the VP uh, velocity. Once you have this VP velocity, you can get the same uh, uh, travel time residuals that you can get from seismic data. So you can compare directly, uh, let's say, uh, quantum mechanics to uh, seismic, seismic data. What's the difference between I, iron, HCP, and BCC? So if you take here the proving direction and you, and you plot it against a relative uh, to the value at the equatorial, and here you have polar direction, you can see they are very similar here, but then you get to the polar direction, iron, BCC shows about 3% of anisotropy, just like you, you measure it. Uh, with seismic data, whereas iron HCP gets lower than 2%. So now comes the point, how can you orientate your model phases to explain the, the anisotropy in the earth inner core? Basically, there are two, two methods. You can follow uh, the minimum misfit of, of seismic data, so you just oriented your crystal up to the point where you get the maximum of seismic data, or simply following the earth core cooling direction. So the Earth core, uh, core can cool, you know, it's uh, the hottest place in the Earth, so uh, uh, this is cooling in, uh, toward the surface, but can cool in a radial way or in cylindrical symmetry. So you can just try to orient your system, your model phases, in order to reproduce this uh, symmetry on the other symmetry and see which one of them is the most likely in the Earth inner core. So the one uh, you can use it, for example, is the Bera Iron BCC. It's a cubic uh, symmetry, and the, this will represent sort of a spherical radial uh, cooling direction. Then if you rotate this, uh, this system in the, with the faster velocity along the Earth spinning axis, then you have a, a cylindrical radial uh, symmetry, and you can take also Iron HCP in the vertical, horizontal, uh, here I just removed the horizontal direction because you don't take basically any seismic data. And if you account now for the LPO variation, it means that you, of course one model phases can uh, orient the one direction or the other, but you can have efficiency. So it can be oriented 100% when the LPO is 1, or it can be 0% uh, where everything is randomly oriented. So you can build up your, your model for the Earth inner core, Again, you have residuals, you have proving direction, 19 degrees is equatorial, zero is polar. Uh, points are seismic data. Again, red are 
Western Hemisphere proving and blue are uh, Eastern Hemisphere uh, proving. So you can see from the zero line, Western are slower, Eastern are faster. And uh, those lines here uh, in blue and green and gray represent the different model I've been talking before. So the gray is the cylindrical iron BCC. The blue is the bare iron BCC and the green is the iron HCP. What you can see here that uh, in the equatorial points, you have basically positive residuals are taken by hexagonal and cylindrical iron uh, BCC. Negatives are from uh, iron BCC. And in the central part, you have uh, negatives are all iron hexagonal. Positive are a merge of the two different polymorphs of iron BCC. And uh, very interesting, in the, these western points here are very anisotropic. You see a very up from the zero line. And this can be justified only by assuming the existence of the gray uh, structure, which is uh, the cylindrical iron BCC. So this model has been called the candy proper model. You can imagine why this comes from. So this is a shape, OK? Using this model has been possible to two minutes. Yeah. It has been possible to have a picture of what's coming, uh, coming up on the Earth inner core. So uh, here you have, uh, again, the crystallizing side, the western side, and the melting side, the eastern side. So you can see, clearly see hexagonal iron, a very clear separate domains. You have iron BCC, the bare iron BCC, again uh, crystallized here in a very separate domains, and uh, cylindrical iron BCC. And uh, then I can show you before that we have uh, expecting to have a drift of material to, uh, um, to fix the central mass. And the, what is clear here, in the eastern hemisphere, you have a spotty-like distribution. You don't have any more the domains distribution. So this can be addressed to the fact that here, temperature conditions are enough to uh, separate different iron polymorphs, whereas in this side, you don't have any more these conditions. So the, the crystallization and all these phases, they are overlapped together. If you bin now the, the seismic data over 50 kilometers proving depth, and you differentiate what kind of uh, uh, phases reproduce the observed seismic data, you can see that the iron BCC in a cylindrical symmetry is always the preferred phases, even though at 400 kilometers, they just to get together, OK? So this, uh, this confirmed that iron BCC is probably the, the phases, uh, which is likely at the shallower part of the Earth inner core, and also uh, confirm that perhaps the, the heat flux goes in the cylindrical symmetry just as proposed from geothe geothermal uh, simulation. What was coming after 400 uh, kilometers? Well, it's unknown. You cannot reach here uh, for the moment with seismic data proving. Uh, but there are people that have been uh, saying that we could find uh, possibly an earth inner inner core, another slab. Okay. So To conclude, I think in this last part, I tried to demonstrate that you can first okay, or use seismology to observe some uh, features. And you can try to use uh, condensed matter theory, both uh, theory and experimentals, to provide model phases. And uh, over bridging to geodynamical models, you can try to get an interdisciplinary Earth inner core scenario. In the case of the Earth inner core, we we see clear that thermal heterogeneities are responsible for the dichotomy. And you have a western hemisphere with very clear domains separated. Uh, so BCC and HCP can be separated each other. And in the, in the other hemisphere, you have, a, contrary to the, other, to the western one, you have a spotty-like distribution. So less differentiation uh, conditions are not differentiating the two polymorphs. And, uh, here you can might conclude that the cylindrical radial the direction is the preferred uh, direction for losing heat in the Earth inner core. And this is a very in good agreement with ge geodynamic simulation. OK, thank, thank you very much.
Roy, if you have any question. Yeah. Oh, so you're basically just absorbing our uh, seismical data and don't do any experiments, right? Uh, OK, speaking about myself, I observe in seismic data and I let some other people doing high pressure and temperature experiments. Okay, so when I say that you use Adam Williamson equation to have the density distribution, so you have to assume that you have a, a density value to start with on each shell. So how do you know the density of this shell? So this is, comes from uh, experimental high pressure and temperature experiments, uh, the condition you likely expect to have this shell, and to bridge with uh, quantum mechanics. So you have you need to have a, a starting density to get the density profile I've been showing before. So experiments in the sense is a high pressure physics. Okay, so you take iron for instance, and you put a high pressure and temperature, and you get the equation of states. That is fine. It works for me. I can use it for a seismic model to produce the all the way evolution of density inside the the earth inner core. Yeah. So you, you mean you mean the, the the effect of the earth inner core in plume zones? Of course, the 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 the, the heat flow comes from the center of the earth, which is the hottest. Yeah, of course, it comes anisotropic. It's not it's not radial diffusion. It is very very complex way of diffusing uh, diffusing the heat. So. This is my, uh, it's not my, it's actually the reason why uh, plumes or, or uh, plate tectonics and uh, everything is given by the diffusion of uh, heat from the earth inner core. Not in a regular radial way, it's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, I think that is uh, remarkable because uh, most of, uh, as well as far as we know, most of the Earth's terrestrial-like planets don't have, for instance, Mars or that plane yeah. We have it. It is uh, exceptional and it has an, a huge impact on development. That was the first one. The second one, um, well, geochemists explain since uh, several decades ago, so, it looks like that there are some fingerprints that the uh, might be the reversal of subduction. Over all the time, geophysicists uh, couldn't say that they didn't find any, any evidence, any proof on that. But this is no longer totally so clear since about uh, one and a half decades, where we first found that under special circumstances, subduction can run up to the formal boundary. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very recent some models that give evidence, or let's let me be a little more careful, some, some strong indication that if proving is not the reversal, but it, it seems to be that other reductions make some conditions what allow us to uh, make a proof on that point. That is the, the so-called geochemical files, what, uh, what is this part? And um, last but not least, uh, it should be mentioned that uh, there is no doubt that in the mantle is stored much more uh, carbon dioxide and also water than in the whole atmosphere. And it is also clear from Earth's history, from climate development, that there is an exchange. Um, organism has a huge impact, so there is a very strong relation between, finally, between plate tectonics and material exchange between the interior of the planet and the atmosphere. Finally, a huge impact to uh, climate development.
Yeah, it's a couple system, uh, it's clear. Yeah.